Hi, good evening. This is Sergio. Um, nice to see you tonight. Um, I'm going to start my uh, slideshow. There you go. Okay, it's about uh, our language core. I believe there is only one human language and I, I travel around for over 30 years looking for all these cultural uh, similarities and this is the view of the basket starfish and you can see that uh, it shares the same core because I believe all languages are related. No language is isolated, no language is above others. So do not look at things as a tree and then we have hierarchy. So um, this is uh, again the picture showing you how interlacing all those uh, cores are and I hope that we can change a bit the view uh, that we have to look at the world's human history and I'm presenting to you a feminine uh, view from the East. Uh, I hope that I can uh, at least give you some new thoughts you know to look at your world. Okay here I am. Thank you again for uh, tuning in. Um, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about the spiritual world of the ancient people because without uh, looking at, let me shut that off first, okay, sorry. Uh, without really looking into the mind of the ancient people, we will not be able to explain why a certain word is connected. So uh, you will be prepared that uh, I will bring you deep into the head of the ancient people, how they look at the world. The three things that we will look at today is the movement of air, which become wind, and also uh, a bird, and also a bull, okay? Now we're going to start. Give me one second. Okay, it should start in a minute. Yes, I'm going to show the spiritual world of the ancients uh, because it is impossible to understand human language development without digging into their head. Okay, and uh, in these slides, you will see that uh, the concepts were built into languages long, long time ago in a multifaceted way. So it's very difficult to take them out as one linear line. Okay. And uh, as I said, the three things we would look at is air and its movement, which is wind, and then the bird and the blue bull. And basically, all these are the energy symbol in nature. Uh, the word anima itself is actually wind in ancient Greek, you know, so uh, it is uh, the wind that brings out a lot of energy. First of all, this is air movement. And again, uh, back to the same uh, mutation of words and sound. The A always somehow, uh, don't ask me why, because this is just a phenomenon. The A always converted to the K or the K sound, K, K sound. So when the wind is very strong, it becomes gale, of course. So um, you, what you see now is a Sumerian E or A, and that's actually to mean uh, action, to do something, or also it means to speak, to say something. As you see at the beginning, all the ancient religious books, you know, when the gods say something, it became the truth, you know. So creation is actually by the movement of air. Okay, this is uh, also to Marian R, it means uh, water itself, it also somehow means the sound of a bird R. You have to pay attention to this uh, symbol there because you will see a lot of similarity down there. Okay, now Chinese has a, this uh, three line thing, it actually means air movement also. And if you compare it to the other one here, and you will see the similarity, they both show air that way. And then uh, for Chinese, this is water. And this is water in Sumerian, this is water in Chinese. Okay, and the other, as I said, the other, other energy symbol that I will show is the ego itself, uh, one of the birds. And of course, the word still exists as agila. Agila uh, it, and it's flight because it has to fly in air, emptiness and vacuum, okay? And then the other word that uh, I can bring it out to you is Garuda. Garuda is actually the symbol of the Indonesian airline. It is that sacred ego that uh, protects the people and which is the vessel of God. 
and uh, this is Chinese again. Chinese has uh, uh, R, okay, R is actually uh, anything like a pro, uh, uh, raven like that. And also it's a bird of prey. And another bird of prey in hieroglyph, you know, is a voucher right there. It used as the uh, vow R. As you can see, uh, this is R, a bird. This is R, a Chinese a bird. And again, um, even though it is uh, expressed in a different way, this is also R means the cry of a bird, which you can actually understand it like this, as the air wave of the sound. Okay, um, the other bird I want you to look at is a silhouette, because they are big lump of different kinds of water bird like there, right there, you can uh, also refer to. And um, this is in hieroglyph, the sound is ach. Ach is all actually uh, the meaning of so. And um, of course, you know, talking about so, you know that in hieroglyph there is this bull head car, which means part of the so also. Of course, um, the owl rock, which is already extinct, is a very ancient breed of bull itself and owl. In China, in Cantonese, it's still the cattle. And of course, uh, the alf, the uh, English, uh, I mean, the Western writing system, the alphabetic system, the alf became the alpha is actually uh, came from the bull head also and of course the ke ke sound words uh, is the cattle okay and uh, then this is proto sinaitic in the Sinai area in Egypt this is alf as I said this is a Chinese symbol meaning a lot of unseen energy and this is Phoenician the alpha coming from the bull head and of course you know the bull head is like this and when you turn it around it, it really become the A what you're using now and this is why this alpha bull uh, represents all kinds of authority which leads the writing system the A. Okay, and then the other word that you are going to see today is this uh, Duati. Duati is actually a, a, ibis, a bird that uh, the ancient Egyptian used it to represent the god of writing, but uh, it serves as a very important purpose because this is a god which, uh, who actually stayed in the uh, afterworld and who makes record of all the doings of the of the dead, you know, so uh, the Ach, he here and, and, and this bird here has a kind of uh, relationship because they are both uh, uh, have a foot in, in the rim of the dead, okay? So um, today, uh, because of this name, it's Ruwati, and you actually are going to look at the G and the J sound, okay? Um, Again, I will show you here how attributes embedded in sound and uh, images in since ancient time. And you can see these pictures easily in the internet. This is the, uh, also this one. And this is the uh, one of the earliest god, you know, his name is Anne. And as you can see, the vowel A is still leading this. He's the god of the sky. And of course the sky, you can actually also think of ether and air. All this, look at that they are all lead by vowel. So this A-E-I-O-U sound, I have said it many times, it is a representation of the living sound. It is only the living that can make this sound. Okay, and also uh, his son, you know, the god called Enki, again, is lead by a vowel. If you pay attention in different religions, you know, either they are begin with an a vowel, a, 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 or the god will be beginning with a K sound or the Krishna because uh, they are all either a creator or the actor, okay? So it's always A or K. And this Anki uh, later on, you know, it become uh, in Akkadian, uh, become air. You see, it is still, you know, a diphthong, you know, also made of vowels. And of course, you know, as I said, you know, this is the, the bull head that you have to look up to and um, as you can see you know the ancient actually uh, put on this kind of bull head to put the attribute into their own body this is to show that how powerful this person is of course he has a four horn four pairs of horn not just four horn four pairs of horn and in Sumerian they have a cuneiform like this so now I can look at cuneiform really as a pictograph you can still see that this is the uh, R sound and uh, which uh, actually can represent uh, the 
bird also and also this scar part actually you can see clearly you know the four pair of horn right there it means to lead to lead as, is someone with authority okay and then um you will see that uh as i said the a this symbol means a bird's cry or the water and then uh this is uh by itself, the bull itself, uh, I shouldn't say a bull, a bull, I mean, you know, any kind of two-horned animal. It can be a ram, can be a deer, anything, okay, a, 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 it's a gu sound. And actually in hieroglyph, I mean, no, sorry, in Sanskrit and in Chinese, we also have the gu and ge sound for the bull as well, the cattle as well. So you see this aga is actually a combination this of these two symbols together. So um, also I want you to look at air. Air, as I said, if, if the meaning means a bird's cry and also water, you will see that the attribute of this Anki here, you will see that he has an eagle with him and it also, you know, he has the water right next to him. So he's because he's the god of water. And the other thing I want you to pay attention to is it shows the early uh, falcon tree. It shows that that people already know how to tame a falcon. This kind of image actually passed down all the way into the later Greek god Zeus. Zeus, if you look at the, a lot of ancient coins, you will see that Zeus were, uh, was also always holding an eagle or a vulture. That means they are already taming the vulture themselves. And the other thing I want you to look at, after look at all these male, you have to look at the female goddess. Again, the female goddess always also start with the vow itself. This is a very powerful living uh, life bringer okay the ish the inana and also later become the ishtar which actually also become your word easter okay and she's the god of this of love fertility and procreation and she's actually winged pay attention a little bit of attention all these male actually are not winged only the female is winged other than the bull head and she has actually the the horn and also the wings together. So it seems that she is actually more powerful in the ancient's eye because she actually has the power to give baby, of course, life bringer, okay? And um, later on, you will see that uh, the society gradually change and things change. But before you see the images, I want to show you two Chinese writing. This is, uh, they actually share very similar sound. This is Ji and Ji. And this, as you can see, is actually a, a, a horn head and this is a uh uh, like a bird and both uh, they mean actually come and go and again this is action itself a lot of this action were represented uh, for their living energy and if you can see that the living energy actually sparks life itself uh, because without the movement initial movement there was no life all the mythology of the ancient creation of the world always started with the spark of energy okay and you will see that all the female has a pair of wing and also a head of bull horn and but then later on you know in about two th three thousand years ago and uh, you see the Akkadian all began to actually incorporate the wing into the male themselves. You see this is a bull itself and it become winged and long before that the males were not winged as much as the female. So you will see that the patriarchal society actually takes more power slowly. And then uh, I, in this slide, I want to show you uh, how they look at the essence and the key or the life force of life. Uh, I will compare, of course, the bird and the cattle. But before you do that, I will show you uh, this little read. Uh, as you can see, uh, in many of my slides before in other episodes, I already show you this key or G. Uh, actually, it uh, means a read or the essence itself, the gist of something. So you will see that they already put a, some kind of a bullhorn right there so now let me go to the cattle side okay this is the af which is actually the cow a female okay the gu is the male and then the car in hieroglyph is actually the male head but i'm not going to concentrate on this but i want you to know that from this gu or kersang you will find cattle the the word cattle in all world languages they will always have a 
歌声或者歌声 ，no matter in Sanskrit, in Chinese, in Hungarian, in Turkish, you can easily find this sound representing the cattle. But since I'm going into the spiritual world, not the animal itself, so I will continue with the this A sound right here. Okay, and the、uh, Proto-Sinaitic have the elf, and then the Chinese, as I said, ow. We say ow. Okay. And then also we have this symbol always means some energy right there, unseen energy. And this is the early Phoenician and also、uh, early、uh, ancient Hebrew as well. This is the alpha or aleph, and then it turn around and become the later a. And sometimes you see still see the a、uh, right written in this way in an artistic form. So it's actually going back all the way to the Sumerian earlier pictograph. So nothing actually dies out, and of course, you know this A actually、uh, go to the other side, become your、uh, writing present writing K. Okay,、uh, if you look at the meaning itself, the essence, the G or the G, you will、uh, directly go to the Egyptian hieroglyph Ka, which means part of the soul, and also familiar with this. This is the Chinese unseen energy symbol of unseen energy, and the Chinese did not、uh, leave the sound right there. But we have a bunch of other words writing,、uh, which sounds as gay, gin, or gay. All this actually mean key, soul, or soul, and、uh, you will see how. Close they were. You see this sound and this sound. They were actually meaning exactly the same thing. It's only that the Chinese invented other writing for that meaning much later. And this is now we go to the bird side. As I said,、uh, this is the symbol. Either means water or the、uh, bird cry. And I also want to remind you, the Chinese has this is water and this is sound and air. You will see that this is just turning it ninety degrees this way or that way, and、uh, hieroglyph. This is R, and this is the so ah, and again this is the essence and the gist, which means also the so. And this has a, a relationship. Still, the relationship is between R sound and the G or K K sound. Okay. And then this is Chinese R, which is also、uh, the raven itself of the crows. Also,、uh, in basic pagan belief, they are always also related to the other, the death rim. Okay, the soul. And、um, again, this word, the G and the J, you need to look at. And this is、uh, linear B. Linear B is the Proto Greek writing, and this is the、uh, the syllable Jo. You see this Jowati, and this is actually Jo. But I want to show you a Japanese word. This is a Japanese word. Juru, juru is actually means the crane.、Uh, the crane itself. Look at this silhouette. As as I said before, the bird itself, you know, can be a number of water bird and aggregated bird. And also,、uh, this is a later、uh, different manuscript in Latin. This is the G, and this is also the G. And、uh, as the G and the J all, always are confused and. But the half G also get confused with the K when you say G is actually confused with the K. Okay, so this is a very versatile sign. It goes this way to G and it goes way this way to J. Okay, and、um, when you look at all these, when all these were connected to so, look at this word itself in Sanskrit is Jiva. Jiva is actually life itself, and this word. Look at this. Bird right there, the jiva and the juru. You hear the sound j and j. And look at this here. It is actually also、uh, drawn there. You can actually look at Sanskrit sometimes also as an、uh, ideograph, okay? And、uh, maintaining the sound j, j and genus. Genus in Latin. And become your genus, or、uh, in in English now it's again it's birth related. Now it's not death. Now it's be begin with life. You know, so one end is the, the but the soul. You know, can mean you know a new life or the past life. So you see the similarity with j j jin, 
And interestingly, the Chinese has a word Jing. Even though we we uh, spell it seems differently, but if you pay attention to the sound j jin Jing, right here Jing actually means uh, an essence, just or the sperm itself, the sperm which makes life. And uh, look at this little spark right there. It's actually drawn in the Chinese. And as I said, it, it means just, and you see this all sound, jiva, jinus, just, jin. And of course, in English, it also mutate between this k, ki, and just. You see how each language has its own mutation, has its own synonym. And again, I want you to draw, I want to draw the attention to this, you know, this ancient Sumerian and the Chinese, uh, both the Gay, gin, gin, gay, and this ki right there all mean the essence and the key. These were all the ancient uh, life force symbols, okay? And uh, now I want to show uh, to give a jot to accept the thinking. Why do I say that with light one cannot see? Truly, with the electric light now, we don't see the world as the ancients do. And uh, because I lived a long time in very remote places without electricity, I learned one thing that with the fire with the sunlight I actually see a lot of things I don't normally see with electric light and um, you can see that you know the uh, the the, air, the steam that comes out from a human being is very very strong it is very natural that ancient actually take it as the soul itself once they see a living being without this air coming out you know they know that it's dead and then with perfume one cannot smell again you know i follow the church a long time and i follow actually the mosque also a long time i notice that when i go into a dark mosque you know in very remote places when there is no light no window whenever there is a small hole when the light shines through whenever there there is incense whenever there is a smell it feels so much stronger than you are you feel that in a very modern world so all these things you know you do not feel as much as you feel in a very modern setting so in order to understand words sometimes we really have to go back to very ancient settings okay so now I want to show you the how the ancients show the energy Okay, uh, as I said, you know, the two hanbu actually become the A. You will see easily that why this, this is all Greek on this side. Okay, this is English on this side. You will see that the air, the ether, all begin with a vowel. And animals, which is the wind, and you know that the wind is never stagnant. As much as the ancient belief that the soul or the living force is never stagnant. Just like the Chinese believe the qi, the qi is never stagnant as well. So the alma, uh, I mean the aima, the aima is blood because because the ancient Greek believed that the soul lived in the blood itself. So again, I show you a comic, and this is the sound of a living soul, and the Indian actually believed that the, uh, the vowel sound themselves, you know, they were the souls of the consonant, and of course, you know, the soul of the speech. Without consonant, you can never make one single sound. So these are the souled words. Animal, because it came from the anima, of which is the wind, because the the the, the living spirit gets in your body you become mobile and you become an animal anthropoid and then and andre is also the greek word for human being a man alma is also um the uh, soul and atman is the sanskrit word for soul if you speak a uh, german atom is the word breathe and then arthur the word arthur itself has close connection to the sanskrit word arthur which means the reason the beginning and then also Adi. You see all these were lead by this uh, unseen energy there, A. Eh? And of course it shows motion, the action, alive, advance, arrive, appear, emerge. Why these uh, were all led by vows? It, because it was built in a long, long time ago. And also your emotion. Your emotion is that little soul inside it, that, that makes you feel. Uh, you feel angry, you feel uh, also the, 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 the 
uh, adjective of audacity and then uh, how come where is happiness okay so happiness doesn't seem to stay with the bull image itself it actually stay with the little bird itself and the little bird actually brings in the those word uh, you see the bird form right there glad glee gay uh, of course you know it also mutates to the word joy but uh, take a note that um, Joy, happiness is what more than people look for. The ancient people actually do not look for joy. The ancient people look for peace. And you have to understand there's a big difference. And okay, I want to show you this picture right there, the bird form. Okay, the uh, as I said, the J and the G and the G, G, G. Sound here, right there. They are actually can be lumped together. I do not do it as a linguist. The linguist actually invented all the writing, you know, to make things even more confused. But when I live in the real world, when I travel from village to village, from city to city, from town to town, and all these people were actually speaking with a gem of all these sounds. You know, one person can say it with this, the other person will say it with that. You know, it's never, never standardized. It is only in the modern world that we tend to standardize them and we tend to distinguish them. But for the ancient, you know, and, and also the less developed places, all these sounds actually were treated as the same sound. Now I look, I show you a bunch of words to show that um, this is the bird form. Um, Gerano, uh, if you speak read it by English, you know, it's Gerano, it means a crane, it's the cur sound right there, but actually it doesn't, if you agree, it doesn't sound as Gerano, okay? It is Gerano, either it's a G, or sometimes you can hear people say Gerano, it's almost an H, sometimes you hear people say Gerano, it's almost a Y. So, um, even you write it down, but uh, my ear kept telling me that people speaking in different, you know, uh, uh, forms of this slum of uh, sounds okay and this is coptic this is a girl gamma this is a hot g okay and then this is the chinese joe and this is the linear b joe look at the silhouette of the bird and this is the japanese juru which is a crane and this is uh, very clearly uh,